Okay. Hopefully, we're actually ready here. Um, if you have your large catechism, the um, bigger one, it's, or the, the Book of Concord, I guess, it's, uh, what, page 408, I think that's where we'll begin. I don't know on the little one. I don't have it, so. Um, what do you have there, Matthew? Lord's, for, uh, Prayer, Lord's, Lord's Prayer, Part 3, Lord's Prayer, the very beginning of page this section. Lord's Prayer is my favorite part. Which, sec which, which page? 117. 117. It's your, favorite, it's your favorite section in the large catechism? Why is it your favorite section? Now i got to know. You know, if you missed last time, my goodness, the back half of the third article is so, so good and definitely worth going back and rereading because it is, it's so helpful in reminding us why we gather on Sundays, why it's important that we gather together around the word and what the Holy Spirit is doing. Um, so... Go back, check that out. It's, it's just so good. Uh, but we'll start on part three, prayer. So you have the <clears throat> six chief parts of the catechism, right? Uh, you get to part three, we have the Lord's Prayer. We now have heard what we must do and believe in what things the best and happiest life consists. Now, follow the third part how we ought, uh, follows the third part how we ought to pray. For we are in a situation where no person can perfectly keep the Ten Commandments even though he has begun to believe. The devil with all his power together with the world and our flesh resists our efforts. Therefore, Nothing is more necessary than that we should continually turn towards God's ear, call upon him, and pray to him. We must pray that he would give, preserve, and increase faith in us, and that the fulfillment of the Ten Commandments, and the fulfillment of the uh, Ten Commandments. We pray that he would remove everything that is in our way and that opposes us in these matters. So that we might know what and how to pray, our Lord Christ has himself taught us both the way and the words, as we shall see. Okay, so we've gone through the Ten Commandments. We have revealed our shortcomings, our needs. Um, and the, the catechism is kind of set up in a, in a helpful order. Isn't it? You go through the Ten Commandments and you go, uh-oh, <laughs> we're in trouble. And then you get the Apostles' Creed. And what is the Apostles' Creed? It's gospel. Here is God and what he's done for you. Okay, then it takes us to the third article. Now what's our response? What's our response? So... We are sinners who need the Lord's help. The Lord is there to help us. We get to call on the Lord in prayer. We get to ask him to come to our aid. Um, so the devil with all his power together with the world and our flesh resists our efforts. You ever felt that? <laughs> yeah. How quick are we to pray? We're still working on it, aren't we? Um, Guess what? That's not new. That's not unique. That's pretty typical. So uh, the Lord has given us, though, this wonderful prayer. And so what did the disciples ask? Lord, teach us to pray. And he does. Okay, so we're, we'll keep going here. But before we explain the Lord's Prayer part by part, it is necessary first to encourage and stir people up to prayer as Christ and the apostles have done. And the first thing to know is that our, it is our duty to pray because of God's commandment. 
for that's what we heard in the second commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. We are required to pray that holy name and call upon it in every need or to pray. To call upon God's name is nothing other than to pray. Prayer is just as strictly and seriously commanded as all other commandments. To have no other God, to kill, or not to kill, not to steal, and so on. Let no one think that it makes no difference whether he prays or not. Common people think this, who grope in such delusion and ask, why should I pray? Who knows whether God heeds or will hear my prayer? If I do not pray, someone else will. And so they fall into the habit of never praying. They build a false argument as though we taught that there is no duty or need for prayer because we reject false and hypocritical prayers. Aha, I'm so pious I don't even have to pray. <laughs> All right, so why should we pray? First thing that Luther says is what? God commands it. It's not an option. Are you a Christian? Well, then you are to pray. This is, uh, he goes back to the second commandment, right? You shall have no other gods is the first commandment. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. That's the second commandment. Both of those relate to prayer, don't they? If you call upon the name of the Lord, you are keeping the second commandment. It's what God is instructing you to do. So um, the first thing is, why should we pray? God tells you to. <laughs> Good enough reason right there. We probably don't even need to go any further, but uh, we'll keep going. But it is certainly true that the prayers that have been offered up till now when men were battling and bawling in the churches were not prayers. Such outward matters of prayer, when they are properly done, Maybe a good exercise for young children, scholars, and simple persons. <laughs> Classic Luther, right? Uh, yes, yeah, you know, children, scholars, and simple persons. Um, you're so learned, you don't even need to pray as the Lord has taught you. You got other ways to go about things, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, they may be called singing or reading, but not really praying. But praying, as the second commandment teaches, is to call upon God in every need. He requires this of us and has not left it to our choice. But it is our duty and obligation to pray if we would be Christians, just as it is our duty and obligation to obey our parents and the government. For by calling upon God's name and praying, his name is honored and used well. This you must note above all things, so that you may silence and reject thoughts that would keep and deter us from prayer. It would be useful, or it would be useless uh, for a son to say to his father, What good does my obedience do to me? It, I will go and do what I can. It makes no difference. But there stands the commandment. You shall and must obey. So here, prayer is not left to the will, uh, left to uh, my will, to do it or leave it undone, but it shall and must be offered at the risk of God's wrath and displeasure. All right, so uh, when we disobey God, what do we call that? Sin. <laughs> what does sin bring? God's wrath. Well, failing to pray is sin. So we can sin by commission, right? An active thing that we are doing, we're committing that sin. We can sin by omission, failing to do that which God has commanded us to do. Uh, we're perfectly capable of both, aren't we? And it's good that God is merciful because otherwise we'd be in big trouble. All right, thoughts any, uh, so far, anything? Or we'll keep rolling, because there's a lot. <laughs> okay, uh, we're at 10 here. Maybe this point, oh, yep. Your Honor, some nice Christians, or you might just call it just reading and so on, are singing. There is something to be said.
does teach a lot of content. Oh, sure. But a lot of the whole book, I mean, the whole, the, from the beginning, after, after Andy kind of got started, yeah. what did he do? He sort of worked on it. Mm-hmm. Um, especially with, uh, with, you know, bad brain and whatever. Sometimes that's the only thing you can think of to say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's not that it's necessarily bad. It's no. <laughs> and, and, uh, I don't, and, and clearly that's not what Luther is getting at because he kept those things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when, he, uh, when he reformed the liturgy, he didn't get rid of that. Uh, so what he is talking about, though, is, you know, when it's prayer for show, when it's, you know, look how impressive my prayer is, uh, because of how eloquent I am or because of how long I can pray or, you know, whatever. There, there can be all kinds of ways of doing this, right? Um, but actually just praying, um, calling upon God, it can look a lot of different ways, can it? But you know when you're actually praying and you know when you're just kind of there, don't you? Maybe you're not thinking about it when you're just kind of there at the moment, but you can reflect back and go, yeah, I wasn't actually praying. Can we do that with the Lord's Prayer? Yeah, we can get to it. Let's just rattle through that thing as quick as we can so we can get done with this thing. Um, That is not what we're called to do. Um, So how can we keep from doing that? Well, set your mind on what you are doing. And you can't necessarily, as you're praying the Lord's Prayer each time, you might not be able to think through all of the petitions equally, right? It's okay if you can set your mind on even one of them and really, really uh, focus on that as you're praying it. That's good. Okay. Uh, We're at 10 there. This point is to be understood and noted before everything else. Then, by this point, we may silence and cast away the thoughts that would keep and deter us from praying, as though it does not matter if we pray, or as though prayer was commanded for those who are holier and in better favor with God than we are. Indeed, the human heart is by nature so hopeless that it often flees from God and imagines that he does not wish or desire our prayer. Because we are sinners and we have earned nothing but wrath, against such thoughts, I say, we should remember this commandment and turn to God so that we may not stir up his anger more uh, by such disobedience. For by this commandment, God lets us plainly understand that he will not cast away, cast us away from him or chase us away. This is true even though we are sinners. But instead he draws us to himself so that we might humble ourselves before him, bewail this misery and plight of ours, and pray for grace and help. Therefore, we read in the scriptures that he is also angry with those who were punished for their sins because they did not return to him and by their prayers turn away his wrath and seek his uh, his grace we were going through um with the little kids had co-op this morning we were going through um cain and abel and last week we went through adam and eve okay after adam and eve sin god goes uh god Go, go, you know, God, God is obviously aware of this, right? What's the first thing God says? Where are you? <laughs> he says, where are you? What is the first thing he says to Adam and Eve after they sin? Where are you? What's the first thing he says to Cain after he has sinned? Where is Abel, your brother? <laughs> he knows, right? Why is he... Why is he putting this as a question? Because it's it's his invitation to come, repent, and receive grace. He wants them to come and confess their sins and receive mercy. 
You know, you get you can think of the old hymn, right? Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Well, what's he calling? He's calling to sinners, come home, receive that forgiveness. <laughs> that's uh, that's exactly how it works. So when we sin, we don't want to avoid God. We want to go to God. Um, and when there, when we're uh, um, being chastened by God even what do we want to do go back to him he's gracious and merciful slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love Jonah's like man I knew it God <laughs> I knew you were going to forgive them you're, you're gracious and merciful slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love <sighs> I really wanted you to be wrathful <laughs> you know Wrath for for others, right? Grace for uh, for us. That's that's uh, how we often think of it. Okay, twelve. Now, from this, uh, from the fact that the that prayer is so solemnly commanded, you are to conclude and think that no one should in any way despise his prayer. Instead, he should count on prayer. He should always turn to an illustration from the other commandments. A child should in no way despise his obedience to father and mother, but should always think, this work is a work of obedience. What I do, I do for no other reason than I may walk in obedience and the commandment of God. On this obedience, I can settle and stand firm. And I can value it as a great thing, not because of my worthiness, but because of the commandment. So here also, we should think about the words we pray and the things we pray for as things demanded by God and done in obedience to him. We should think, on my account, this prayer would amount to nothing, but it shall succeed because God has commanded it. Therefore, everybody, no matter what he has to say in prayer, should always come before God in obedience to this commandment. This is beautiful. Are you worthy to have your prayer heard? That's not the right question, is it? God has commanded you to pray, and so his command is pray, and he will hear. He will hear, and he will answer. And so... Bringing things to God in prayer is not bothering him. <laughs> it's not um, being prideful and thinking, huh, well, I'm holy enough, God will hear my prayer. Uh, but it's humbly trusting the Lord. And, well, the Lord has commanded, therefore I will pray, and God will hear and God will answer. It's great. Really? Oh, man. All right, 14. We pray, therefore, and encourage everyone most diligently to take this counsel to heart and by no means despise our prayer. For up till now, it has been taught in the devil's name that no one should think about these things. People thought it was enough to have done the act of praying, whether God would hear it or not. But... That is taking prayer on a risk and murmuring it at a venture. Therefore, it is a lost prayer. For we let thoughts like these lead us astray and stop us. I am not worthy, or holy or worthy enough. If I were as holy and godly as St. Peter or St. Paul, then I would pray. But such thoughts, uh, but put such thoughts far away. For the same commandment that applied to St. Paul applies also to me. The second commandment is given as much on my account as on his account, so that Paul can boast about no better or holier commandment. <laughs> okay, so I've had times where uh, people would come and say, well, Pastor, you know, can you pray? Because God's, God's more likely to hear your prayer than mine. Well, that's, that's wrong. <laughs> Can't ask Paul to pray for us. We could, I guess. We talked about that before. I've got a video I can show you about this, of a, of a study that we've done. <laughs> 
Um, but but I think sometimes people do feel this way, don't they? Um, other people are better at praying. Other people are you know have a holier life. Um, so I'll kind of leave that to them, and I'll contribute in my own way to the kingdom of God. But that's not really my gift. Uh, well, sorry, not an option. <laughs> You're part of the family of God. This is a commandment God has given you. You will pray. If you are a Christian, you will pray. Okay? Uh, 16. You should say, my prayer is as precious, holy, and pleasing to God as that of St. Paul or of the most holy saints. This is the reason. I will gladly grant that Paul is personally more holy. But that's not because of the commandment. God does not consider prayer because of the person, but because of his word and obedience to it. For I rest on, I rest my prayer on the same commandments on which all the saints rest their prayer. Furthermore, I pray for the same thing that they all pray for and always have prayed. Besides, I have just as great a need of what I pray for as the those great saints. No, even a greater one than they. <laughs> so, I don't match up to St. Paul. Cool, you should pray more then. <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, all right. Um, all right, 17. Let this be the first and most important point that all our, all our prayer must be based upon and uh, uh, and rest of, uh, upon obedience to God, regardless of who we are, whether we are sinners or saints, worthy or unworthy. We must know that God will not have our prayer treated as a joke, but he will be angry and punish those who do not pray, just as surely as he punishes all other disobedience. Furthermore, he will not allow our prayers to be in vain or lost. For if he did not intend to answer your prayer, he would not ask you to pray and add such a severe commandment to it. In the second place, we should be more encouraged as and moved to pray because God has also added a promise and declared that it shall surely be done for us as we pray. He says in Psalm 50, verse 15, Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you. And, and Christ says in the Gospel of Matthew, Ask and it will be given to you. For everyone who asks receives. Such promises certainly ought to encourage and kindle our hearts to pray with pleasure and delight. For he testifies with his own word that our prayer is heartily pleasing to him. Furthermore, it shall certainly be heard and granted in order that we may not despise it or think lightly of it and pray based on chance. Okay, so you've been commanded to pray. That's the reason number one. Second reason to pray, God's promise. Right? He has promised to hear and answer. Well, all right. Should that be enough? It should certainly be enough. Uh, 21, you can raise this point with him and say, Here I come, dear Father, and pray, not because of my own purpose or because of my own worthiness, but I pray because of your commandment and promise, which cannot fail or deceive me. Whoever, therefore, does not believe this promise must note again that he outrages God like a person who thoroughly dishonors him and accuses him of falsehood. Okay. Grace alone, salvation by grace alone through faith in Christ does not mean, well, then, then there's no acts of faith that follow. You know, acts of faith are going to follow for those who genuinely do believe, correct? And prayer will be one of those things that we see for those who actually have faith in Christ. Uh, but I, I love the way Luther, you know, here I come, dear Father, and pray. <laughs> um, yeah. Can you talk to God like that? Yeah. Yeah. 
All right, 22. Besides this, we should be moved and drawn to prayer. For in addition to this commandment and promise, God expects us and he himself arranges the words and form of prayer for us. He places them on our lips for how and what we should pray so that we may see uh, how heartily he pities us in our distress and uh, we may never doubt that such prayer is pleasing to him and shall certainly be answered. This, the Lord's Prayer, is a great advantage indeed over all other prayers that it is a uh, that, uh, that it is a uh, I'm sorry uh, this the Lord's Prayer is a great advantage indeed over all other prayers that we might compose ourselves for in our own prayers the conscience would ever be in doubt and say I have prayed but who knows if it pleases him or whether I have hit upon the right proportions and form therefore there is no nobler prayer to be found upon earth than the Lord's Prayer. We pray it daily because it has this excellent testimony that God loves to hear it. We ought not to surrender this for all the riches in the world. Well, is praying the Lord's Prayer as, as, as good as praying whatever is on your heart? Well, hopefully what's on your heart is then able to be seen through the lens of the Lord's Prayer. We're going to see how that can work. Uh, but what Luther is saying here is what? Uh, if, it, if you're just kind of making up your own prayer, maybe it's a really wonderful prayer that, that is uh, God-pleasing, and maybe it's uh, deficient in some way. Um, now, I don't think we should ever feel like, well, I got to be really careful not to pray in such a way that it's uh, missing something. But uh, what his point is, is rather to say, uh, but the Lord's Prayer, it, it's, it's going to be God pleasing. You know that because Jesus taught you, here's how to pray. And so if you pray in that way, it, it's going to be a God pleasing prayer, right? So I, I don't know what to pray. Okay, pray the Lord's Prayer. But shouldn't I come up with my own? Well, it's good to do that in addition to it. But it's not deficient to pray the Lord's Prayer. Okay? 24, the Lord's Prayer has also been prescribed so that we would see and consider the distress that ought to drive and compel us to pray without ceasing. For whoever would pray must have something to present, stake, and name which he desires. Uh, if he does not, it cannot be called a prayer. Uh, we have rightly rejected the prayers of monks and priests who howl and growl day and night like fiends. But none of them think that praying for a hair's breadth of anything. If we would assemble all the churches together with all churchmen, they would be bound to confess that they have never from the heart, pray for even a drop of wine. For none of them has ever intended to pray from obedience to God and faith in his promise. No one has thought about any need. But when they, they had done their best, they thought no further than this, to do a good work by which they might repay God. They were unwilling to take anything from him, but wished only to give him something. All right, so what do we like to do? We like to turn things around where we're doing stuff for God. Ah, uh, see God, I'm praying. Look how good I am. Look how I'm honoring you. Aren't you impressed with me? <laughs> Rather than, God, you've invited me to pray. I'm bringing these things before you. I know you're going to hear. I know you're going to answer. I'm trusting in you. It's not about me. It's about you. See, we, we, we love to do this, don't we? This is our human nature. We love to make it about us doing something for God rather than I'm calling upon the Lord and he's going to do something for me.
where at the end, like one or one or one six six six, that's where you need to register. Mm -hmm. That's not asking God to register. Not necessarily. Is, yeah. Is that, is that not a valid prayer? I don't think that's what it's saying. Yeah. Well, what are you what are you desiring with the uh, the, the uh, first psalm? Uh, to not be like the ungodly, but be like the righteous. Uh huh. Okay. And you know, and even a you know, okay, a psalm of praise to God. What what are you desiring? To praise God, to honor Him, uh, because He is rightly to be honored, and you're expecting good from Him because He's good. He's God. So, 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 a good expectation in the midst of you having our, our hearts rightly aligned with him, even if we're not just like explicitly asking him for stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, going back to the definition of the uh, first commandment, you know, what does it mean to have a God? Right, that which you fear, love, and trust in. Sounds a lot like Psalm one. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? And so now. I'm, I'm looking to God. I'm trusting in him. I'm fearing him. I'm honoring him. I'm, I'm, I'm expecting he's going to do God things <laughs> for me. And I'm relying on him. So when I'm giving praise to God, it's because I, I'm trusting. He's worthy of this. He's going to provide. He's going to do the things he's promised. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's that back to that, you know, first commandment, that our hearts and our, our faith, uh, trusting in him. Okay. Pastor. Yeah. Um, this is such a stark contrast to the one that I get to where I just, it's, at least what I've experienced from life, and, and I can only speak for those that know talk to therapists, that can adjust stuff. Right. Um, when we talk about naming something, speaking certain things, that's the, you know, not, I hear that through a different lens than. Name it and claim it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the word prayer was the reason God ever spoken. Yeah, and, and I bet it wasn't using psalms either. <laughs> no, they're being spoken, I think. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what they were, but they were just gibberish. So. Um, but I guess what I'm saying is that when, when, when I, and I, at least as I go through this, and you see what, try, try to interpret what, what Luke is saying here. Yeah. There, there's a, I think it's reverence. Yep. Because we trust him. Well, now, even when we ask for something, it's like the trust you have for your parents. I'm asking for this, but I know my parents know better than I do. Yeah. And they're going to give me that which is good. Um, and so I'm not trying to manipulate them. Now, if, if I'm actually acting rightly, right? As kids, sometimes we don't. As adults, going to God, sometimes we do try to manipulate, right? But that's not, that's not how we ought to. To approach him, ought to pray. Yeah. Yeah, and, and ultimately, where I'm getting at here is that coming from that, and being so often confused as to why, why didn't God respond the mm -hmm. way that I thought He would? Mm -hmm. To go into a place where I have a promise attached to what this is actually about. Right. That's different. Yeah. Then I, and I know I'm going to find that. Yeah. And I don't have to even worry about his answer because I know his answer is going to be good. Um, so that's really refreshing and really yeah. liberating. Well, and it's, you know, it, you think about the, the um, Isaiah with the prophets of Baal. Or Isaiah, Elijah with the prophets of Baal, right? What are they doing? They're, they're dancing and crying out and they even start cutting themselves because we're trying to get God's attention. And Isaiah is just like, ah, no, all right, God, okay. Do your thing. Um, it, when we have the promise, we don't have to do great things to get God to pay attention and to answer our prayer. He's promised. He's commanded it even. He's going to hear. He's going to answer. Not necessarily the way I always want, 
but it's going to answer in the way that's going to be best. And I know that because I know God is good. Rick? At some point, man, it's like you're almost like, you know, six times five, six hundred, six hundred, and really starting to kind of go with this whole picture of prayer is not because it's very clear that, you know, your stomach or sugar is feeding from the lungs that you get. Mm-hmm. But you're asking for the bread and the bread. Yeah. Because we don't always know what his will is. Correct. You know, we might think we do. And sometimes, you know, and we do we do know in some ways, correct? Because it'll be in his word, right? Correct. Yeah, so but I mean the thing is is that, that to me that has, you know, the perspective in the name of praying it. It's like yeah, but that's you know, if that's not his will, then forget it. Yeah. And and do you really want to convince God of something that's contrary to his will? <laughs> That sounds really dangerous, doesn't it? That's right. Give it a try. Who knows? Uh, No. But God will answer our prayer in line with his will then. Mm-hmm. That being said, well, so. That he's going to, 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 that that person is going to receive the gift of salvation. Well, is the, the is, is it a guarantee? No. Um, is there, so ultimately here's, here's where, as, as Lutherans, we get to just say, God is God, and we're not. And we don't have to figure out how to rationalize everything, right? Let God be God, and where God has not spoken, we better keep silent. And where God has revealed his will, great. We, uh, we can count on that. But where God speaks in ways that seem contradictory even to us, we simply get to look, go, well, I don't know, but God knows, so I don't have to worry about it. Correct, because that's what he's commanded you to do. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, God will not force someone. Um, if if someone is is you know rejecting him, um, then well, that is on them, not on him. Uh, so yeah, we have the. Does God predestine us for salvation? Yes. Does God predestine people to damnation? No. So Calvinists like to reconcile that and go, well, double predestination. Uh, Arminians like to say, well, you have to decide to follow the Lord or reject him. And we say, well, you can reject, but salvation is entirely a gift of God accomplished by him. You had no part in it. <laughs> and people don't like that because they want to rationalize it. And go, we go, well... Sorry, it's just what scripture says. So if you don't understand it, that's okay. God does. Right? I don't have to understand. Um, I'll let God be God. Okay. 26. We, about where there is to be a true prayer, there must be seriousness. There you go. Jake was just talking about that, right? Uh, People must feel their distress, and such distress presses them and compels them to call and cry out. Then prayer will be made willingly, as it ought to be. People will need no teaching about how to prepare for it and to reach the proper devotion. But the distress that ought to concern us most, both for ourselves and everyone, uh, you will find abundantly set forth in the Lord's Prayer. Therefore, this prayer also serves as a reminder so that we meditate on it and lay it to uh, lay it to heart and do not fail to pray. For we all have enough things that we lack. The great problem is that we do not feel or recognize this. 
Therefore, God also requires that you weep and ask for such needs and wants, not because he does not know them, but so that you may kindle your heart to stronger and greater desires and make wide open your cloak to receive much. In other words, um, prayer is for your sake, not for God's. So when you pray and in, in praying and meditating on these things, you recognize these needs, um, that's good for you, isn't it? Because then you're, go, you're going to God and going, I got nothing. Your hands are open. And he's able and ready and willing to grant what is being prayed for. Okay. 28. Every one of us should form the daily habit from his youth of praying for all his needs. He should pray. Whenever he notices anything affecting his interests or that of other people whom uh, he may live, um, he should pray for preachers, the government, neighbors, household servants, and always, as we have said, to hold up God, uh, hold up to God his commandment and promise, knowing that he will not have them disregarded. This I say because I would like to see these things brought home again to the people so that they might learn to pray and not go about coldly and indifferently. They become daily more unfit for prayer because of indifference. That is just what the devil desires and for which he works with all his powers. He is well aware what damage and harm it does him when prayer is done properly. Uh, so Luther goes through some of the things. Well, how do we know we should pray for those things? Because God tells us in his word. <laughs> so um, that which God commands us to pray for in his word, well, all right, that's great, really good place to start, isn't it? Uh, so it, clearly when Luther's teaching the Lord's Prayer, he's not saying, use these words and only these words. Don't go outside of this. But he's saying, yep, Here's a great prayer to be prayed. Pray this. You can use it as a structure for your prayer life, but your prayers are going to include all kinds of other things as well, and, and they're going to be able to fit under these petitions. Uh, but whether you categorize it as such or not, pray uh, boldly for the things that God has commanded you to pray. Uh, so we could, we could start a big list of things for which we should pray. And it's a lot, right? Let's just think think of some things. What are, what are some things we should pray for? Leaders. Leaders. Yes. Do you think they need that? Yeah. Have you watched the news? <laughs> yes. Pray for your leaders. What if you don't like them? Well, all the more reason to pray for them, right? <laughs> okay. Who else? Or what else? Patience. Patience. I, I mean, some of us need to pray for patience. But, you know. yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, yeah, spiritual gifts. Well, because you're, you're saying, okay, God's going to give those things, right? What else? Okay, peace, strength, faithfulness. Okay. our church fellow members please yes for pastors uh, um, for women who are pregnant for the children in the church for the shut-ins in the church for uh, Christians in areas of persecution for um, employment for ourselves and for others for um, teachers you know, we can go on and on and on. There's a reason that we have the prayer insert in our bulletins every week. And it's got some category categories you can kind of group things into. Is that the only way to do it? No. But if you don't know where to start, start there. Right? Good place to start. Is it overwhelming, the number of things that we have listed there? 
No. We have a relatively short list of things. Um, but I think I think people sometimes feel like if I can't pray for all things, then I probably just, there, there, there's no point. It's kind of the same attitude people have sometimes with exercise. Like, if I can't go to the gym five times a week and really be there for an hour and dedicate myself, well, then there's some point in exercising. Yeah, there's still a point in exercising. If you can get 10, 15 minutes uh, of a walk in, go do that. If you can pray for five minutes, that's better than praying for zero. <laughs> if you pray for two minutes, it's still better than praying for zero. So don't think I need to pray more, but just pray. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Probably my favorite part in this whole thing here. Here we go. We're starting at 30. We need to know this. All our shelter and protection rest in prayer alone. For we are far too weak to deal with the devil and all his power and followers who set themselves against us. They might easily crush us under their feet. Therefore, we must consider and take up those weapons with which Christians must be armed in order to stand against the devil. For what do you imagine has done such great things up till now? What has stopped or quelled the counsels, purposes, murder, and riot of our enemies by which the devil thought he would crush us together with the gospel? It is the prayer of a few godly people standing in the middle like an iron wall for our side. Otherwise, they would have witnessed a far different tragedy. They would have seen how the devil with all... Uh, how the devil would have destroyed all Germany in its own blood. But now our enemies may confidently ridicule prayer and make a mockery of it. However, we shall still be a match for both, uh, both for them and the devil by prayer alone. If only we persevere diligently and do not become slack. For whenever a godly Christian prays, Dear Father, let your will be done, God speaks from on high and says, Yes, dear child, it shall be so, in spite of the devil and all the world. Whew! <laughs> it's so good. Um, I'm a doer, and so when a problem arises I want to leap into action and do something about it and my first instinct is not to pray it should be but it's not <laughs> why would I think that I can fix something better than God could so why would I act first rather than go to the Almighty and say, okay, Lord, you take care of this, and then I'll, I'll do what I can do. You can use me as you will, but put it in God's hands first. Um, this is a, a lesson I have to continuously get beat into me by the Lord because I'm just slow of learning. Not so slow. <laughs> um, but... I think sometimes we, we think prayer is the last resort. We don't say that, but we act like that. Well, I've tried everything else. I guess we better pray. How about we pray first and then try everything else? You know, we have the Almighty. Right? The, the maker of heaven and earth, the one by whom all things were made, the one who part of the Red Sea, drowned Pharaoh's army, the one who conquered sin, death, and the devil, I, I think maybe we should ask for him for help. All right. All right. Thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. Because you don't, you're acting at least as if God doesn't care. Yeah. And of course, with that attitude of thankfulness, 
serve and obey him. And I, I like to reframe it as this. It's not the power of prayer, but the power, power of the one to whom we pray. Yeah. And, and because I think sometimes people think, um, like, I have power by praying instead of God has power. And because of him, I pray and he will act. Um, I'm not saying that's what you were saying in any way, shape or form. But um, it's, it's not wrong to speak about the power of prayer. But I think it can be misconstrued. I guess I guess what I'm saying is it's specifically focusing on the word with my people. Yeah. 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 And so what does God say? If, if you just do what I tell you to do, <laughs> right? Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will answer you. You will glorify me. Okay. So 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 do it. And we're so reluctant. We're so hesitant. We're so slow to it. Um, you know, it's like, it's like a little kid that is like, no, I have to do it myself. And you know, they can't do it themselves, you know, whatever the, the task might be. And they are bound and determined, I'm going to do it. And finally, you know, after they've tried everything, finally, mom and dad are allowed to help, right? Uh, man, why, why do it the hard way when you can just go to God? Yeah, because that's our problem, is pride. Yeah. It's pride. If we humble ourselves, well, then we are in our correct spot, and God is in his correct spot in how we view him, and uh, things are ordered rightly. Yeah. Other, other, Mark? So it doesn't even matter because he has already made his mind up. So yeah. why should I bother to pray? Well, oh, I should pray because then if that thing happens, then I'll feel good about it. I can just pray. Yeah. Uh, well, what do we see in scripture? Do we see an example of somebody praying and God doing something different? Yeah, we sure do. I should go and smite Israel off the face of the earth. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, prayer actually accomplishes things, doesn't it? Okay, uh, let's finish this. 33, let this be said as encouragement so that people may learn, first of all, to value prayer as something great and precious and to make proper distinction between babbling and praying for something. For we by no means reject prayer. We reject the bare, useless howling and murmuring as Christ himself also rejects and prohibits a long, uh, long, idle talk. Uh, now, we shall most briefly and clearly explain the Lord's Prayer. Here, there is included in seven successive articles or petitions every need that never ceases to apply to us. Each is so great that it ought to drive us to keep praying the Lord's Prayer all our lives. Okay. Uh, but I already outgrew the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> yeah, nope, never going to happen. You don't outgrow the Lord's Prayer. You grow deeper into an understanding of it, deeper into a proper appreciation and use of it. You never grow beyond it. Okay, let's pray. You going to pray, Mary? 
Heavenly Father, thank you for hearing our prayer. You've commanded us to pray, and so we are. You have promised to hear and answer, and so you will. We ask that you would also work in our hearts, uh, that we would be quick to pray, not calling upon you only as a last resort, but calling upon you first and foremost, honoring you, trusting you, uh, keeping the commandment that you've given us. We thank you for the opportunity to pray so that we can turn to you and we can understand that you are God and we are not, and that you will care for us in the way that is best. Uh, help us to be ready and willing uh, to turn to you in all situations and to make use of the prayers that you have taught us in your word. We pray this in Jesus' name.